Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast presented by Strategic Treasure, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. On this episode of the 2019 Outlook series, Craig Jeffrey sits down with Paul Higdon, Co-Chief Technology Officer, and Michael Coleman, Head of Business Development and Consulting of Ion Treasury, on their expectations for 2019. Mike and Paul provide insight on the reemergence of money market funds, the rise of open banking, predictive technology, and machine learning, while explaining their significance from a treasury management perspective. Why should treasurers be aware of these topics and what will be their impact on their organization? Listen in to find out. Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, and we are in the middle of the 2019 Outlook series. I am here with Ion Treasury. Ion is one of the largest treasury management systems technology providers. They have seven core products, which you may be familiar with. This includes Treasura, ITS, IT2, City Financials, Reval, Wall Street Suite, and OpenLink. I'm talking with Michael Coleman, who's the chief strategy officer. He's based in New York. He's uh, been on the FinTech hot seat uh, at uh, the AFP with us. And also Paul Higdon, he's the chief product officer. He's based out of London, but he's sitting with Michael in New York today. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Thanks for having us, Craig. Good morning. This series, we're covering a number of items, uh, and I'll just give uh, the listeners uh, a quick overview. We're going to talk about LIBOR as a replacement, what's replacing LIBOR, an aspect of the money market fund changes. Uh, We're going to look at APIs, and then we're going to focus on predictive technology and some of its applications, and then we'll circle back and end with what organizations are doing with communities. So, uh, First, I, I want to cover technology and treasury process implications in the context of a number of changes that are taking place during this next year. And, you know, as we start with the benchmark rate of LIBOR, which is used in so many contracts, LIBOR is going away. There's the uh, end date of 2021 looming, over $350 trillion worth of derivatives, bonds, and loans are benchmarked off of this rate. So, Mike, I'd like you just give us your take on what's going on with the LIBOR replacement and what what do we need to think about from a treasury technology perspective? Well, I think the $350 trillion number is is certainly a gigantic number. But what's actually, I, I think, even scarier is that it likely understates the value of the outstanding contracts where IBOR is embedded. So corporations have... Um, revenue, supplier contracts, lease contracts, pension policies, insurance policies, all with LIBOR, IBOR uh, referenced mechanisms embedded in them. Um, It's also important that we don't ignore the IBOR-based intercompany loan portfolio or in-house deposit and loan agreements that also reference IBOR to facilitate their in-house banking activities. And in addition, for items placed on the balance sheet that are on the balance sheet at their fair value, the valuation, the cash flows that impact that fair value are likely also discounted off of IBOR, adding really another element to the entire LIBOR exposure picture. The impact, the number of assets and activity that's related to, to LIBOR and some of the IBOR ratings is, is enormous. It's you know very significant. But uh, what should companies do? do or what should they be getting started on to deal with this change, whether it's for intercompany or external contracts? Yeah, you know, it, it's almost like that understanding where your exposures are, it, you need to really go out and turn over every single stone and really look to, to understand where LIBOR exposure could be present. And so I think with the end date of 2021 looming, as you said, it's really important to start now. And so we'd recommend really focusing this calendar year on understanding where your exposure is and begin to develop a strategy on how to address each of the items. So there are still 
some unanswered questions with regard to the whole IBOR replacement, we would recommend that you speak to you know your advisors, big four briefings, ISDA evolutions, reading blogs, white papers, and really just begin, if you haven't already done so, to educate yourself because the impact will be quite significant. So if 2019 is a time of exploring and gaining information, how do you turn the, the page and look at strategy? So what, what guidance would you give on laying out that strategy to move towards a replacement once you've gained insight into what some of the best minds are thinking with regard to this change? Well, since the exposure internally in the organization is, is so far reaching, it's important to really get the key stakeholders involved. Really raising this to the C-suite level uh, to raise awareness internally is, is really quite critical. So the key stakeholder groups that are likely to be involved you know, would include the, you know, the general ones that you'd expect, treasury group, uh, accounting, procurement, legal, tax, IT. And, and as I mentioned, you know, speaking to auditors, advisors, and, and really making sure that the business units themselves are also aware that this is going on and, and raise every, anything to that group that is, is really leading the charge, that stakeholder group. If you're successful in doing this, you should really be able to understand what that exposure is and then begin to break it down and create strategies to manage the implications of each of the items. In terms of strategies, I think one clear one is understanding what exposures will live beyond that 2021 date. So for any contracts that do live beyond the 2021 date, there should be planning and anticipation that they're likely going to require amendments and some repapering work should be planned. This could be time consuming, it could be costly, and it might result in certain decisions to refinance. I think that there are in a, in a number of contracts, fallback provisions uh, in the event, you know, LIBOR as, as the reference rate may not become available. This is most likely, I think what uh, all, all the experts are saying is, is likely insufficient. Um, it's unsustainable in the current agreements. And so this is certainly a key area in ISDA agreements. The, the ISDA is, is meeting to um, define really how definitions will change. So it, it will be important to follow along. All of that is external. And your ability to control that is somewhat limited. Your ability to control actually for your intercompany loan portfolio is, is much more within, within your control. And so for this, a general approach could be that you amend loan agreements with the replacement rate and agree on a somewhat of a transition date. So any interest periods that would start, let's say, after a transition date would use the replacement rate. And this way, you're sure to be able to have a rate available, and also, you'll be also be able to maintain that arm's length um, lending standard. Also, when it comes to valuation of uh, derivative agreements, um, you know, specifically on, on swaps, this can also get a little tricky. And so it's important to understand and ask yourselves in, within the organization some certain questions to define what you really need to consider. So for example, will you need to maintain historical valuations of these securities? And this can get a little tricky as, as you get to that period of transition where part of an agreement might actually be referencing a LIBOR rate and another part of the agreement might actually be referencing the replacement rate. And you need to plan that transition appropriately so that you actually maintain the accurate value, historical valuations. Another consideration is how can you adjust the spreads for the changing benchmarks so that your fixings are accurate? This might involve updates to the systems where you manage uh, certain agreements. Is there a central source that provides rates um, for your organization? So for example, does Treasury provide IBOR rates throughout the organization as the central source and provider. So we need to update and maintain the processes for, for those as you um, distribute new rates. And reaching out to your technology partners internally, externally, speaking to your peers is also going to be an, another important aspect of this whole transition. And then finally, the other consideration is on future funding strategies in the next three years as we're approaching 2021 and whether or not 
as you put new agreements in place, you want to re continue to reference IBOR, or if you will begin to adopt the new uh, risk-free rates, uh, which would be the replacement rates, as it pertains to risk management activities, technology capabilities, and hedging decisions. So with that, there's a lot to consider, which is why in 2019, we should really take advantage of the time to understand, wrap your arms around really what your exposure is, because that's the starting point for all of this. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of complexity there with those changes, especially for longer term instruments that roll over the uh, sunset of, uh, of LIBOR. Let's shift to uh, money market funds now as we're talking about interest rates, short term rates. You know, money market funds, institutional money market funds really began reemerging in a significant way during 2018. Uh, rates have risen pulled a lot more companies back into this asset class, a lot more assets flowed back into there. Maybe you could talk about some of the changes in the institutional money market fund space that are making it more attractive and, and more complex following the financial crisis of years past and some of the regulations that came forward. Yeah, I think it's a great point. It, it, certainly, the financial crisis has, had changed a lot in the, in the worlds of corporate treasury in, in terms of keeping more cash on hand, liquid in short term investments. Obviously, at the same time, we also saw interest rates go to zero or sometimes negative. And now we're, we're getting to a period of time when we're seeing interest rates come back. And in the movement of funds into money market funds has actually been quite interesting. And so I was just looking at some data before this podcast. And there are $3 trillion invested in money market funds. $190 billion of new funds flowed into money market funds during the fourth quarter of last year, of 2018. And this has really been the highest inflow of funds since the fourth quarter of, of 2009. So it is quite interesting to see this, and it's not surprising the flow of funds is, is coming now because rates on the money market funds are somewhere around 2.5%. Following a period of time when rates were at half a percent until early 2016, and now breaking the 2% mark in, in mid-2018. The other uh, implication that we, we also saw was um, with, with money market fund reform. And so when we look at um, the impact that that had, the investment in money market funds really took a dramatic shift from large institutional funds and into government treasury retail funds following this reform. And the reform introduced the concept of floating net asset values or, or variable net asset values or NAV for the large institutional funds, which is different from the government treasury retail funds that are still uh, have a stable net asset value. Yeah, let me ask you a question on that, Mike. With that change to floating NAV, as a system provider, you had to make some changes for that. What did you have to do? Just give us a glimpse into what you've had to do to adapt to this uh, change in, in operating models for these funds. What changed really is the price of the fund was marked at a dollar for stable net asset value funds. So this switch to floating NAV, that $1 share price changes. It floats, just, just like the name implies. And so in order to accommodate for the changing valuation, bringing in certain money market fund factors, updating the, the price and all the downstream implications um, in terms of you know, valuing the underlying investment, your overall investment in money market funds, accounting for valuation changes, all had to be updated. So while we made the technology updates required to manage the floating net asset value funds, what we, what we saw was, was not a very large uptake in that functionality because while the functionality provides the support to manage it, at rates that were half a percent or, or, or even lower, a lot of companies like we saw in, in where the flow of funds went was, was really more towards the stable net asset value funds. And so we didn't see the uptake of the floating net asset values, even though we provided management for that in our technology solutions. Now, as we fast forward to today, where rates are at 2.5%, they are attractive. Perhaps the large institutional funds are becoming 
more interesting to corporations who may be willing to adopt. So I would urge others to contact their technology partners and review what capabilities they have in order to manage those floating net asset value funds. And that could help reduce some of the and manage some of the complexity that comes along with it. So another another area of change, uh, money market funds and the technology required to support those. And as we shift to the third topic, uh, APIs, connecting via open API, we get to bring Paul into the conversation. And, you know, a, a key part of that element is, Paul, you and I have talked about 2019, as you've talked about APIs and open APIs. You've defined 2019 or described it as the rise of open banking. Yeah, our, our view is that, that APIs are becoming more prominent, and we think 2019 could be the year where we start to see more adoption by the corporate treasury community. But it's worth taking a you know, step back because APIs are really just one piece of a bigger technology puzzle. And it's probably worth reflecting on the fact that we're pretty much in the middle of what we might call a digital revolution right now. And very interesting to see that technology is transforming both our personal lives and our work lives. The APIs are gonna play a key part in that, but just one part. So it's interesting to kind of reflect back how we've got to where we are. And if we look back over the past 30 years, I think there are three key events that have happened that mean that we need these APIs. The first one is the increase in computing power. And this has been astounding. If you, th you think back to the 1980s, which was just 30 years ago, the most powerful computer in the world was something called the Cray 2 supercomputer. That cost $34 million. And if we look at the processing power that we all have today, a simple cell phone like the Apple iPhone X has got 10 times the processing power of one of those supercomputers. It costs around $1,000, and we get to carry it around in our pockets. So this really has the ability to, to transform the way we process information. The second big thing is the rise of the internet. Looking back only 20 years, the internet was really in its infancy, and there were only about 16 million users worldwide, and that's less than half a percent of the global population. Fast forward 20 years, by 2017, 4.2 billion of us have ready access to the internet. That's, that's about 55% of the world's population. And this is not stopping, this is increasing. We're all becoming connected, we've all got these super fast computers accessible to us. And then the last point, there's been a real desire to go mobile. Even going back 10 years, the first iPad hadn't even been launched. Within three years of its launch, it had already superseded sales of desktop computers. So this is a real indicator that we, as a population, we're demanding immediate access to information and then gradually we're expecting to be able to transact and act upon that information at any time, from anywhere, on any device. And it's the APIs that are actually going to facilitate this. Basically act as the glue to, to bring these different concepts together and start delivering value to Treasury. I mean, the term open banking is, is a hot topic. And really this is an, an initiative that's been placed upon the banks to create increased transparency to their customers and potentially allowing increased mobility so, so customers can move between banks more effectively. They're facilitating that through APIs and that's where we come to this, this term open APIs. And, and one concrete example that we've been working on is the collection of bank balances. So a number of the banks have produced an API that you can call that will deliver real-time transparency into exactly how much cash you have in one or all of your bank accounts from a single API call. Gone are the days of relying on prior day files and, and intra intraday transactions to know how much cash you've got. In this brave new world of APIs, imagine the not too distant future when all of the banks have delivered this capability then you'll be able to get real-time transparency into exactly how much cash you've got on a global basis. So, so the impact is, for Treasury, this one example is real-time as opposed to just prior day, uh, just faster, is it, uh, and easier to make those connections. What else can be done to leverage this type of technology in Treasury, the use of uh, open APIs? 
Yeah, so it's it's a great question, and it's it's a hard one to answer because we're we're at really early days in in the adoption of these APIs. The the balance example is something that I think is going to impact all treasuries. Another example is as well as balances, these banks are delivering the ability to see your transactions that are going across your bank accounts in real time as well. Imagine what impact that could have on treasury. It really has the ability to to transform or re- revolutionize many um, cash management operations. Imagine your, your treasury management system being completely synchronized, not only with one bank, but with all of your banks, giving you real-time balances and a real-time view into all of the transactions, being able to reconcile those transactions the moment they come into the system, alert you as a user um, if there's an unexpected item so that it can be processed in real time, it completely eliminates the need for end of day or start of day batch processing that most of the cash management departments around the world are are performing today. Okay, that's excellent. So it's not just information, it's alerts, it's it's more real-time data. So as you think about Treasury has long been thirsty for information and it's been coming in drip formats, it's been difficult to get, and as we've expanded the ability to get that information, it sounds like Treasury is going to be getting far more information, and and now it's uh, trying to drink from a fire hose, and and it can perhaps overwhelm the team that's getting all of this real-time data. So how, and maybe we can segue to the next thing about predictive technology and the application of machine learning, how can we handle this deluge of new data and take advantage of it? We can't do it in the traditional ways because we're getting so much more. How can we leverage machine learning to to take advantage of this. Yeah, you're absolutely cr- right. We've, we've, we've solved one problem and we've created another one. We've now got all of this real-time data, so we, we need to create systems that are gonna help digest and make sense of that data and turn it into something useful that the treasury team can, can act upon. And you mentioned machine learning. Um, artificial intelligence in general is something that, again, we are gonna see a, a bigger uptake Um, or adoption in treasury of some of the artificial intelligence techniques and some of the newer techniques as well, I think. It's probably worth clarifying what what, what we mean by artificial intelligence. Classical artificial intelligence has been around for a long time and by artificial intelligence, all we're talking about really is an artificial system that can perform some complex tasks. So you imagine the kind of logic-based systems that have been around since the 1950s, ever since the advent of computing, We've been finding applications for that classical artificial intelligence in Treasury for many years. Things like automating the creation of cash flow schedules based on financial contract terms. Things like generating the accounting related to all of your financial activity. So your entire portfolio, your Treasury system will calculate all of the required journals, including some quite complex business calculations. All of that's already outsourced to these intelligent systems. So there are a couple of new advents in this area of artificial intelligence. One is robotic process automation. We've heard a lot about that in conferences over the last couple of years. And here we're talking about new systems that in fact try to mimic what humans do. They watch what a human does in terms of its interaction with the various systems that the human needs to to perform its job. Um, And then they mimic, They, they play back, they do the same thing. And they allow you to automate processes that require involvement with with many different systems. Now, I don't think generally those RPA solutions are mimicking the thought process of a human um, or trying to enhance decision making. They can be integrated into RPA processes, but it's not, not really the core of what RPA is about. However, there are other new developments in artificial intelligence, such as machine learning, which do bring something completely new to the table. So machine learning is a new kind of artificial intelligence that is able to make use of large data sets and the increased processing power that we talked about with with computers. And it involves self-optimizing algorithms that actually are able to identify patterns uh, and trends and strategies that maybe the human isn't, poss- isn't able to identify themselves. It's a new kind of facility that the human treasurer can work hand in hand with to outperform uh, a human on their own. Maybe you could jump into what makes machine learning so different from the classical AI as you described it. 
It, and I, I think this is why it's a really hot topic at the moment. There have been some significant breakthroughs in machine learning. And in particular, there's a technique. This is going to sound a little bit technical, but it's called deep reinforcement learning. And it's, it's a progression or a development um, within machine learning that, that tries to mimic the way the human brain works in terms of its learning and decision making. And there's been, there's been quite a bit in the news about this recently, and there's a, there's a story that illustrates this, this very well related to computers playing chess, and in particular, computers playing chess against each other. Craig, I'm sure you remember back in, in the 90s when, when Deep Blue from IBM first beat um, Gary Kasparov, who was the, the, the reigning grand chess master at the time. There was, was a big uproar about computers finally being better uh, at something, than, something so complicated as chess than humans. And it, it was a big achievement. Well, 20 years on, I'd say the great grandchild of the Deep Blue program was something called Stockfish. The program had developed to a stage where the, the chess community felt that this application could never be beaten by a human being. It was so good at chess. It had access to over 2,000 years of human strategy. Um, it's got access to a, a huge number of games that it can search almost in instantaneously. So it's got an unfair advantage against any human. That could have been the end of the story, but then we've seen this, this rise of deep reinforcement learning, bringing a new breed of, of artificial intelligence. And in fact, a new program called AlphaZero was released that was a generalized algorithm that could learn to play any game, not only chess. And it was decided to pit this program against Stockfish. AlphaZero was only given four hours to learn how to play chess after it'd be given the rules. So it played itself about nine million times and figured out its own strategies without any input from, from the human strategies. So the two computers were set to battle each other. They played 100 games. 72 of those games were a draw. And then you can guess who won the last 28 games. Sure enough, it was Alpha Zero. This program, this algorithm, had gone from zero knowledge of chess to beating the culminative knowledge of everything that we've built into to, to programs in the past by teaching itself. So it's a very exciting time in, as a technology vendor to now start exploring how we can start taking advantage of similar kinds of algorithms. Yeah, that's excellent. That's a, that seems like a, quite a powerful tool. I, I like the four hours and not played itself nine million games of chess. Uh, that's, uh, that's amazing. But obviously, Treasury has optimization things in, in similar regards to, to game theory and, and in ways that have to be optimized. But it's not a game Treasury, of course. But there are obviously some algorithms that Treasury could use. How, how can this technology be applied directly into the, into the Treasury space that's being done currently or you expect to see happen shortly? Treasury is a, is a completely different ballgame to chess. It's got all sorts of complexities related to uncertainty and complexity in the market that we definitely don't have a solution yet that allows such an algorithm to, to run Treasury for you. But what we are doing is exploring various applications of, of the underlying technology. So for example, we're already using this deep reinforcement learning in a number of ways for things like intrusion detection. Our job is to keep your data safe when you use our treasury systems. So we use this, this technology to monitor access patterns and make sure that we detect anything unusual um, so that we can, we can shut down access if we need to. We use it for things like biometric authentication. As a user, if you're logging into your treasury system and you, you want to approve of high, high value payments, we need to be certain who you are. So we can use deep reinforcement learning for things like um, voice recognition, face recognition, uh, and even, even behavioral pattern recognition. So how you interact with your cell phone, how you type, which angle you use it, you hold it at, um, to make sure you are who you say you are. And then also things like um, natural language processing to make the use of our applications easier. You can, you can type natural language rather than key search terms in order to search through transactions, through menus, through, through help systems. So all of these are essentially invisible applications of, of deep learning that you would already start to get the benefit of within our applications. Paul, I, I like that. The, the first two where you talked about intrusion detection and biometric authentication is really around security. I think that's interesting because so much of the fraud, the criminals are organized, they're using technology to 
penetrate systems, to find weaknesses, and to explore. And so they're making massive use of technology. Now it's a it's also a technology battle to prevent that, to see what's anomalous, to see what's different, to make sure people are who they say they are, not just a machine that has stolen credentials and is now exploring and finding out what's going on. You have described and talked about some of your partnership on looking into uh, other ways to uh, use and leverage AI and machine learning. Maybe you could just talk about that. Sure. I can't, I can't share too much of the detail here, but um, we're now moving into what I'd say is our second phase of trying to find applications that are much more visible to the Treasury team. And to do this, we've actually entered into a partnership with one of the, the leading technical universities in Europe who have specialisms in artificial intelligence. And we're, we're sponsoring a research program there where we've worked with the team to identify some candidates for what we think could potentially be high impact areas of Treasury management that are good candidates for applying machine learning to. For example, actually, I can tell you that the one that came out top of the list is cash forecasting. You know, this is something that has um, proved difficult for treasuries around the world to do accurately. And we're currently exploring with the university there which are the most appropriate algorithms for us to employ to look at historical cash management information and use that along with forecasts from internal entities within the business to provide more accurate forecasting capabilities going forward. And there are a few other applications that we're exploring and we anticipate rolling these into a number of our applications throughout 2019 and, and onwards. So yeah, we, we expect, um, we're obviously investing here, so, so we expect machine learning to play a significant role in the, in the future of treasury management. And we're investing now not only in the technology to build the algorithms, but also starting to think about uh, how we would build the learning data sets that the algorithms need to become really effective across um, the community of all of our, our corporate customers. And just like the chess uh, example of playing 9 million games, there's a, a lot of data needed for that learning environment. And may, maybe we can just shift to the, the last area and bring uh, Mike back in on Treasury Communities. Ion has been talking about communities and what that means for Treasury, both in terms of sharing best practices, leading practices, and data that can provide insights. Uh, I want to just hear some of your thinking on this from a, a technology and or data perspective, Mike. I think all of, almost all of the topics, if, if not all of the topics we covered today, likely that will be covered on this podcast series, really have an element of, of community. It's not just about our organizations, it's really about our industries, our um, practices, and I, I think we start to see that more and more and, and becoming more and more of an integral part of, of really what we do. And so as Paul mentioned with machine learning, for example, our greatest opportunity for new insights requires the ability to, to learn and build off of large data sets and then share those insights and share that learning um, to inform the community as a whole. There is an element of sharing that exists today and when, when we think about community for sure, and I think our, our natural inclination draws us to our peers. I'm, I might be drawn to other people in treasury who have a similar role as the one that I have, or I might be drawn to others who use a similar technology that I use. And I think this is really community in the traditional sense. These communities in this sense play an important role and they will continue to play an important role in advisement, in validation, in promoting shared interests. Is there a better way to do what I'm doing? How will I ever get my arms around understanding this enormous exposure to LIBOR? These communities in the traditional sense can certainly be therapeutic and anxiety reducing for sure. However, when we start to think about the opportunities that new technology brings to us, and we think about communities really more as a source of innovation, in some ways, we can actually find inspiration from non-peers and understanding their experiences. And so, for example, when I go, when any of us go um, do shopping on Amazon, Amazon knows what I want to buy before I even know I want to buy it. And, and so another example that I recently had at the beginning of, of this football season, when I did my fa fantasy draft, it was the first time I ever did a, a fantasy game, but 
I didn't really, I realized I didn't have to do anything because I see the best players that are available to me. I didn't have to know anything about the players. All of the metrics are all being run in the background and it's providing advice to me on, on what I should do. When we think about treasury, I don't think there's a single company that can get to that level of insight that's being provided in the fantasy example or by Amazon, for example. No one company can get to that insight alone. And so it really does require large amounts of users, volume, history, to learn and experience and be able to identify some really interesting insights that will really transform the way that we work today. And it really isn't that far-fetched to expect that in Treasury, the decisions that are being made are fed to us as recommendations from our technology, and it informs the activity really across the entire community. And so as we look into 2019 and beyond, we expect more and more that community will become a greater asset to the whole corporate treasury landscape. This is fascinating. Thank you for that, uh, that discussion on treasury communities and data and wrapping it up. And this, uh, this concludes uh, this episode of the 2019 Outlook, uh, 2019 Treasury Technology Outlook. Mike and Paul, thank you for talking through these ideas on the Treasury Update podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.